Hey folks, welcome to our very exciting, much anticipated review of the Panasonic GH6 camera. Quick disclaimer, this video is not sponsored by Panasonic, but they did send us this GH6 review unit a few weeks before release. Now, for those of you who have followed me along my little camera review journey on Tested, know that I'm a huge fan of the Panasonic GH5. It's a Micro Four Thirds camera that came out 2017, 16, I wanna say. Uh, and I was, I got it right when it came out. I was just blown away by some of the features that they were pushing forward. Uh, it did incredible things at the time, like uh, in-body image stabilization, where the sensor actually uh, uh, moved along with the optical stabilization from the lenses, kind of worked together to give you this really smooth handheld image. And I was doing a lot of dock work at the time. I was doing a lot of travel work. And so having a camera that was super smooth and was small, uh, Micro Four Thirds is a, a smaller body than a full frame sensor. The lenses are all smaller. Everything's a little lighter, a little more easier to travel with. Plus they were doing 422 10-bit uh, 4K video, which for someone like me who edits as well and does a lot of coloring, having all that data as opposed to like a 8-bit 420 uh, codec, which at the time was very common in a lot of the other mirrorless cameras, uh, they were sort of pushing those uh, codecs forward, pushing Im image stabilization forward. They were doing a lot of things that was super exciting. Now, over time, other cameras have caught up to that. Uh, they have those features. Uh, those features are now quite common. Dual native ISO, uh, that being one of them that the GH5S had, which gave you a little bit better lower light performance, it essentially gave you two base ISOs that the camera was super clean at, one being higher so that you can take it in low, lower light situations. Anyway, that's I've been on Panasonic's train for a little while now, uh, and I've just been using it professionally for quite a bit. Like I said, dock jobs, tra a lot of travel jobs. The camera went with me to all sorts of countries, uh, and then I was using it on short films. It was just a very versatile camera that I sort of just fell in love with. And when the Panasonic GH6 got announced, I was super eager to uh, check it out. And we've had this camera for about, I want to say three weeks now. It's uh, It's been released this week. Uh, the, 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 there's been a little bit of delays in the announcements, but essentially that camera now is, is out for people to uh, order. But since we've had it for a few weeks, I wanted to give you this very detailed, as de detailed as I can go, uh, look into the Panasonic GH6. There's a lot of things to go over this in terms of video and photo. I won't be covering that all. Um, I'll do my best to cover a lot of the video stuff that I use uh, and mention some of the photo stuff. And then you can, uh, if this camera still interests you, there's plenty of documentation out there. Or you can contact me directly via social, uh, Twitter, or whatnot if you have specific questions or want me to answer um, you know, specific asks about the camera and what it's capable of. But let's just jump right into this. Let me show you the Panasonic GH6. So let's start by comparing this to the GH5. The body is a little bit bigger. From the GH5 to the GH5S to the GH5 II, that body remained relatively the same. That means all my accessories, my, my tilted cage, I have a cage that kind of wraps around this camera, gives it some protection. Uh, all that stuff was able to uh, translate to all those cameras. This body is different. It's a little bit bigger. Uh, it's not quite as big as the Panasonic S1H, which is their larger form uh, full frame camera but it's a little bit beefier and actually has a little more angular, uh, very similar traits to the GH5, just a little bit hardier. And that's mainly because it's an all new engine inside this thing, a whole new computer setup. It's called, I believe the Venus engine, which allows it to do the things it can do uh, in terms of the upgraded functionality from the GH5. Because of that, they need a whole thermal cooling system here. You, you see some like vents that kind of help uh, push air through it. They have actually added another support here for the LCD screen. Uh, one of the things GH5 was doing uh, at the time that not a lot of people were doing was that front facing camera. You can, if you wanted to do selfies or vlog with this. Uh, this camera wasn't very, very hot with vloggers, uh, being that it was micro four thirds and also the autofocus. Panasonic was notoriously bad on their autofocus for the GH5. I will talk about the autofocus here in the GH6. It has improved. It is not phase detect autofocus, which a lot of people have been talking about, but it has quite improved from what I tested. I didn't do a whole lot of testing. I don't use autofocus that much, so I can't speak to all of the nuances to it. I couldn't understand the GH5 autofocus. I turned it on, I would move around. I never could figure out what it does <laughs> or what, what it's trying to do. This one makes more sense. You have your menu set up, but then you also have a menu system uh, that specifically adds face detect. And so I just did, I basically just did a use the entire image and detect my face and I jumped around and, and it seemed to follow me just fine. I think there are ways you can go in here and actually tell it to be a little more sensitive or you know be less aggressive. I don't really mess around with that stuff too much, but know that it, again, it's not phase detect, but it has improved and it looks pretty, pretty dang usable in my opinion. So the LCD screen, instead of 
just having that, it also adds this extra little bit here. Now that's important for those of us who have rigged this thing up to HDMI cables, to uh, USB-C cables, because before you would always just knock right into those HDMIs. It, uh, the cables come out here, you get HDMI, USB-C, uh, and then your headphone jack and your 1 8 mic jack. Uh, and this thing just couldn't, couldn't rotate past that. So they've added this extra little bit here of articulation to come out and now you can fully clear those cables. Now, being that there is some thermal management happening here, some vents, this camera doesn't get very hot. Uh, I recorded a, I recorded about an hour long piece shooting in ProRes, just straight shooting. Uh, ProRes being one of their heftier camera modes uh, and the camera got a little warm. The button placements are all relatively similar. They've added a couple more quick customizable buttons that I will go over on how I best customize this. The dials, the knobs, everything else feels the same. The shutter wheel is a little bit different. Usually it was like a, a little like a roll thing here. Now it's actually a wheel. It, I've always had a little problem with the placement of this. <laughs> my thumb always sort of hits it and I'm always accidentally changing my shutter when I'm shooting. This doesn't really solve that. I'm still hitting this quite a bit. It's, uh, it's very easy to accidentally just roll that shutter out, uh, but it definitely helps. It helps a little bit more, especially with this larger grip. You can sort of adjust your hand so that you are clearing that thing a little bit more. Other than that, the XLR uh, adapter. So uh, all the Panasonic's have this sort of electronic um, uh, hot shoe, which if you have an XLR uh, adapter for the uh, Panasonic GH5, it works, it basically works across all cameras, S5, GH5, S1 and H. Uh, with the Panasonic GH6, they've added an additional two channels of audio that are reserved for internal audio. This is starting to become more common with a lot more cameras where you get four channels. The first two are gonna be controlled by you as the operator, uh, and then the next two are going to be internal sort of scratch mic. So the two little tiny Microphones up here will be three and four, and then give you some sort of scratch or backup audio while you use your channels one and two for designated um, for designated audio. And then you can choose which ones you wanna monitor in the headset there. So now let's dive into the innards of this camera and how it records an image. Uh, for those of you who use GH5, a lot of this menu system will be familiar in terms of the, the different flavors of codecs and the different compression settings for all that stuff. Like I said, 422, 10-bit, was always huge for Panasonic, and those features are now more more available <laughs> on this camera, but also at higher and, and different frame rates, both variable frame rates and high frame rates. Uh, variable meaning something that you can uh, shoot at a higher frame rate and that it conforms to 24 frames a second, and so you automatically get a slower image. And then there's high frame rate, which just allows you to shoot at something like 60 and have that playback real time, which then you can take into post if you want and change, slow it down if you want, or just stick with your high frame rate of 60 FPS. So this camera has a ton of different frame rates <laughs> that change the, depending on what kind of setting you have. If you really wanna go high speed, then you're gonna be going down to full HD, 1080, and you can do up to like 300 frames a second, which is fantastic. I tested, we do some high frame rate stuff when we're shooting build videos, uh, for, for mostly for stylistic effect of tools and uh, just slowing things down. And we usually stick with a 120 to 240. So 300 is more than what we usually use. 120 is kind of our sweet spot. Uh, this camera does do um, up to 60 in, in, in 4K, but you gotta drop down to 420, the 420 color space as opposed to 422. At 422, you don't have that variable frame rate option, but you can go to the high frame rate of 60 FPS. And so you can do 4K, 422, 10 bit, at 60 FPS or drop it down to 420 and do your uh, uh, variable frame rates there or even down to HD and do frame rates there. Uh, so if that all sounds a little bit confusing, that's because it kind of is. There's documentations and sheets that sort of spell out what these um, all, exactly what they do across the board. But you, once you start dialing through these and messing with the frame rates, you will sort of get a feel for what the camera can do. Really what you're gonna to need to do is go into this my list mode where you can actually take in the codecs that you want. Really, I'm gonna shoot in 4K most of the time and I wanna be able to shoot in 422, but then also 420 when I wanna to go to variable frame rate. And so having that set up into my specific list for the house style and then having this quick button used to uh, switch over to that mode very quickly so that I can get into slow and quick mode uh, is really helpful. So. Look at all those options, figure out which ones you want to use, and then start adding them to your list to customize how you view this stuff in the UI. 
it's going to look daunting at first if you're going to go into and jump into this stuff. Just take a minute, uh, read up about what they are, and then everything will sort of make sense on how they operate in terms of uh, the variable frame rate stuff and, and some of the other functions that have to do with specifically those codecs. But again, 422, 4K, 10-bit, it still looks amazing than this, but now they've added one more thing that I am just drooling over here, and that is ProRes 422HQ internal. ProRes is going to be your least compressed mode. It's what I have worked in for years because it is a codec that's been around forever as being a broadcast standard, very easily digestible by computer systems. It's, uh, it, it, it's basically the best your camera can give you in terms of image-wise. Uh, you're not dealing with H.264 or H.265 compressions. You're getting something with a lot more data. And that can now record internally, which usually was reserved for cameras like Blackmagic. I think if you are in the market, or if you have been looking or having your eye on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera for a while, I urge you to take a quick look at this camera because I feel like this is definitely competing in that space as opposed to the full frame DSLR, mirrorless, uh, you know, A7S's, Canon R5's. This sort of falls in the cinema camera line, uh, in my opinion, in terms of of what it can do, its functionality. And it's got more features, you know, it doesn't have things like internal ND, which is kind of a bummer. I understand that makes everything a little bit trickier, but what the Black Magics don't have are things like optical image stabilization. So your handheld won't look as fantastic or jittery as this camera. But going back to 422, uh, um, I'm sorry, going back to ProRes, this camera can record that internally on C CF Express B cards. <laughs> we have we still have the dual memory card slots. Before we had two SDs. You can do continuous, uh, roll one over to the other when one filled up, uh, which means that you never really had a record limit. You can kind of hot swap as the camera is recording and just keep, keep on going. This camera still has a redundancy, but again, it's reserving one of these slots for the CFast Express cards, which read and write at much, much higher data rates, which allow for ProRes uh, recording. ProRes is just too hefty for SD cards. And I think these, are gonna, these cards are gonna be a little bit more expensive, the CFast, but as consumer cameras become more and more badass, uh, I think uh, CFast cards are going to be sort of the new SD cards. So it's something to invest in. Uh, these are again are CFast B cards and they, uh, Panasonic does have a list of like which ones are compatible. I think most of them will be. And with the, with the ProRes, you can shoot at 5.7K. Uh, almost 6K basically. Having that 5.7K is super fun uh, to bring into post and having ProRes makes it just silky smooth to work with. And the 422, again, you can take that stuff into color. I use the Vlog uh, setting here. There's a bunch of different color profiles. I use Vlog, which then allows me to go into post, add a LUT, do some stylistic stuff, and all that data is there. Now for the color profiles, you still have your standard your natural, uh, your your uh, your sort of more flat look, your cine look, uh, and again again vlog. Now vlog has always been for the GH5 and the GH5 two. Vlog has been sort of vlog. Uh, I don't know what the wording is, but essentially vlog light or like rather. It is it, it's it, vlog was based off of the Vericam 35, which is a professional camera, and that color space used vlog. These cameras mimic that as best as they could, but can never quite get there. It's still pretty indistinguishable, but just know that with this GH6, you are now completely in the Vlog, true Vericam 35 space, so that your color accuracy to that camera, if you were to take this along with the Vericam, uh, your color accuracy would be pretty much equivalent there. So that's a little bit of a change with the Vlog. The Vlog comes pre-installed in this, where I think it'd be before the GH5, you sort of had to buy an upgrade package. Uh, I've been bouncing through that and then also the natural profile. And you can do, uh, you, you can adjust these profiles, uh, little bits here and there. I like to sort of add less sharpening, add less uh, less noise reduction. I kind of want a little less processing to my photos. And so I, I use the natural as my adjustment point, add a little bit, little bit less contrast, uh, sort of increase that dynamic range a bit. You can actually do quite a bit with the uh, like the six or seven controls to your image if you didn't want to deal with like Lightroom as much, if you wanted to sort of dial in a look, you sort of have that functionality here. Now the sensor has been upgraded as well. Uh, the GH5 was a 21.77 megapixel sensor. This one has been upgraded to a 25.2 megapixel sensor and it still has that great 
IBIS in body image stabilization, but it has been improved. All right, so let's for a minute talk about the optical image stabilization on the GH6. So the GH5 has always had the dual um, the dual optical image stabilization. That was a big selling point for me getting that camera. I did a lot of handheld work and I needed something very smooth at a very like, telephoto distance. And so the, the GH5 was kind of a, a groundbreaking um, feature at the time. It had uh, in-body image stabilization, meaning that the sensor actually jiggled within the camera to uh, give you a smoother image. Plus the Lumix lenses also had their own optical image stabilization inside. And so when you paired the Lumix, when you paired the Lumix lenses with the camera, uh, it did this, what's called the dual stabilization, kind of did this handshake and allowed you to get this much smoother image than you would. Meaning if you use prime lenses that didn't have stabilization, there would still be some degree of, of, of in-body stabilization happening, but with those Lumix lenses, you get something much, much smoother. The GH6 has sort of pushed that up quite a bit. Uh, the, the metric that they use to, to, to refer to this stuff is stops. So what the, the GH5 has five stops of in-body image stabilization. The GH52, uh, I believe, has like 6.5. The GH6 is now going up to 7.5 stops of image stabilization. And it's hard to really, it's hard to really show you or even explain to you in those kind of details what that means for the camera. You really have to hold it and feel it and use it yourself because when you actually hit record and you watch that image stabilize and you, you feel yourself jittering, you feel yourself shaking, uh, and you see it just completely smooth out, it's kind of amazing. And I, from what my very little testing I've done with the GH6, uh, that stabilization has become much better on an already top of a very good stabilized body. Uh, so I'm gonna do a few more tests. I got a couple of things I'm gonna shoot. Um, I shot some stuff earlier at the 50 and 70 millimeter focal length. Now this is uh, on the two times crop, so the GH5, it's a, a, a micro four third sensor. And so I was shooting at 25, which equals out to 50, uh, and then 35, which is called the 70. But I wanna shoot in the 120 range. Uh, I wanna shoot both cameras. I have two cameras set up here. Let me give you a cell phone here. But basically what I did was I rigged up two cameras on a, a little RSS rail, and I'm going to essentially start recording on both and handhold them and see how it works out. Yeah, and you'll get a pretty good sense side by side of what this will look like at, again, the 120 focal length. Uh, without any, any stabilization at all, you're gonna get a lot of shake, a lot of jitter, especially on this windy day, as you saw from the cameras falling over. Um, so let's take this rig and let's go test it out there. Okay, yeah, just looking at the monitor here, it is, very nice. Uh, I'm going to have to bring it to the computer to really get a good sense of what is happening, but it already looks super smooth from this distance. Uh, I'm trying to be relatively unbiased here uh, in terms of just holding the rig as I would, but I'm going to actually do some purposeful shakes. I'm going to shake my hands just a little bit more just so we can see, so we can press it and really see how that goes. Again, that is using Lumix lenses. So I'm getting the dual optical image stabilization. There's a little feature, there's a little button you just hit to activate that, but uh, essentially the camera knows that it's being paired up with a Lumix lens and it will sort of do everything for you. So you get the smoothest image possible with that stuff. Again, 7.5 stops, it's a hard metric to really understand. I'm sure there are some kind of standards that explain this better, but just know that uh, if, you, if you use the GH5, that is considered five stops of stabilization. This is 7.5. So it's a pretty big jump there in terms of, of quality difference. Now, this last bit about the sensor, I feel, is very, very important. It is very, very difficult to explain. I think Panasonic's, uh, Panasonic is going to need to figure out a way to communicate this really well <laughs> because there is something different with the ISO and the native base ISOs happening here. Again, the GH5 operated at a native base ISO of 400, I believe. So at 400, you get your cleanest image. And when I did my initial test with the GH5, uh, I slowly moved my ISO up until I got to a noise level that I was comfortable with, uh, which was about 1600. The camera could go up to about 6400, I wanna say, or 3200. Uh, it, I got, to, I got to 1600 and still felt like the image was clean enough to be acceptable for most of my work. After that, it was just became, the, 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 both the chroma and the luminoids became a little bit too much. And so 
that's not a that's not a whole lot of light, especially for a Micro Four Thirds sensor. It 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 didn't operate super well in low light areas, and this is at a time when the Panas uh, the Sony A Seven S Two was out, and people were really into the, those, um, you know, high ISO high sensitivity, uh, I, uh, sensors that can handle that amount handle very low amount of light and give you a clean image. And so Panasonic came out with the GH Five uh, S, which was their low light camera, and that had a uh, what's called a uh, a dual native base ISO which again has now become a, a common thing among filmmakers among ph photography people it is in the lexicon of verbiage the dual native ISO meaning your native ISO of 400 is great but once uh, when you need to go up to a much higher ISO you can go to your second native base which is 2500 in the GF G5 GH5S and that circuit actually changes over to the high base ISO, giving you a very clean image at 2500, just as you'd have a very clean image at 800 or 400. Mm -hmm. And so you have these two modes you can kind of flip through depending on what your light situation was. And that is super fantastic. It is now much more common and it's a great way to avoid noisy images. I would, at that point now with the Sony FX6, with the GH5S, I always just stick with those two base ISOs. I don't really ever take those. I use other means of the exposure triangles to get myself to where I need to be in terms of exposure while keeping a clean image. This does not have dual native ISO. It has something, has something different. It has something else going on in it, which Again, it's going to be difficult for me to convey because I don't know if I completely understand the technology. I think there is a lot of language that Panasonic is using that will help explain it in some of their documentation. But again, it's going to be on them to communicate this correctly so that the people who are looking at this not having a dual native ISO as a, as a flaw are going to be, um, they're going to need to be convinced that what is in this now is better. And what is in this, what is in this now is what they call the dynamic range boost mode. So what does that mean exactly? Think about uh, like HDR photos, right? The, the sensor simultaneously takes an image uh, at a low, uh, like a low ISO or low exposure and a high exposure and then sort of composites that to give you a um, really clean look, a lot of detail in the shadows, but also a lot of detail in the highlights and sort of reduce that contrast, but also sort of make everything very pleasing in terms of visual detail. This is sort of using similar technology, though it doesn't have it that kind of stylistic look to it. All it's really doing is it's it's pulling it's pulling color data from from lower ISOs uh, and also cleaning up the higher ISOs and compositing that. So when you're actually going using that mode and going up into high ISO range territory, you'll get a cleaner image with a little bit more saturation. One thing that happens when you start depending on ISO and depending on a very high ISO to get you your exposure is you actually lose color detail. Um, there's not a whole lot of light to sort of bring that color out. And so you start losing a lot of saturation. If you've noticed like really high ISO, low light images, we'll have a little bit less of that. I did a bunch of tests using this, uh, using this dynamic range boost mode on like a little just camera setup here running through all that stuff so let's go take a look at that right now so iso tests on the gh6 i had the gh5 mark ii uh shooting my reference to the monitor of the gh6 i'm going to take a meter reading so that i get proper exposure so four uh, i'm set to four my camera at the base of 400 ISO, I'm shooting in the natural, I'm sorry, the standard profile on the GH6 because I don't want to mess with this image at all. Really what I'm trying to see is the noise level as it increases throughout the ISO. Uh, usually you want to stick at a base ISO for your cleanest ISO, which is 400 on this camera. The GH5S has the dual native ISOs of 400 and like 2500, I believe. And so those give you both clean images, but it's a little bit harder to tell with this this new sensor technology that's kind of happening here. So I'm going to start stepping this up a stop and take a look at the image later on in post and see if I start seeing uh, a lot of noise in the lower end areas, the darker parts, uh, see how clean the rest of the image stays. So 400 at for Iris, I am going to jump up the, I'm gonna leave everything else the same and go up one stop from the ISO's perspective. So every time you double an ISO, it's basically one stop. So I'm gonna go up to 800, 
and I'm going to drop the ice, the aperture down to 5.6. So we should still have proper exposure on this image, but now we are seeing it at double that ISO, 800. So we are increasing by one stop. I'm going to continue doing this throughout each uh, ISO range, and then I will go back and try the dynamic range boost and see what kind of noise we get there. I feel like we're starting to get noise here, considerable noise in, well, it's hard to tell on the monitor, but I will uh, punch in probably on Robert Downey Jr. there to take a look. So I am seeing a little bit of low end stuff going on and also in some of the mid low areas. So we're at, we're at 3200 ISO. This is the GH5. I'd never go over 1600 ISO. I would stick at 400 for the base. And then if I needed to, uh, the max I would go was 1600, but I'd never go past that because then you'd start seeing some noise. Max ISO of this camera. This is a max ISO of 12,800. I mean, yeah, honestly, yeah, okay. So again, think about what's happening here. I'm not sure quite how to explain this properly, but this, uh, my light meter, my light meter wanted me to expose my camera at ISO 400 f-stop 4. My iris is now closed down to f-22. I mean, I am letting very, very, very little light in. So when you think about the exposure triangle, the aperture, is do, the aperture is doing very little work right now. Because it's so close down, it's not really letting a whole lot of light in, and so the ISO is doing all the heavy lifting. And so that's why you see some noise, but also this is considerably less amount of noise than you'd get with other Micro Four Thirds cameras or the original GH5. So it's pretty impressive what uh, the scene is happening, what's happening in the scene and what the camera is actually doing to make this exposure happen. So that's the entire line of ISOs from uh, the non-dynamic range mode. Um, let's jump over to dynamic range mode. Again, I will leave everything, I will leave this image as manipulated as little as possible. This is the, not, this is the standard profile, no vlog. I'm not doing any kind of color correction, color grading, or any boosts. I really just want to see this for what the camera can do. Standard mode, dynamic range on, which gives me a base ISO of 800, and I will slowly move upwards. So again, you see what I'm talking about here. This is this is a little bit a little bit more color, a little less noise, but I don't quite know I don't quite know where the limit is yet. Again, using dual natives, I know I'm great at 400. I know I'm great at 2500. Here, I'm still figuring it out. I don't I I can't see enough on an LCD screen or even a small HD monitor to really get a feel for how great and clean that image is. So I'm going to have to use this a lot more and take this into post a lot more and really dissect it there. But from what I can gather is, uh, or at least how I'm gonna be using this for a while, is I'm sort of gonna be using this mode as, as my dual native, as my, my low light mode. Now in Vlog specifically, when you turn on dynamic range boost, which is, again, is not available in all the codecs and flavors, and so you kinda have to, <laughs> figure, kinda have to figure your way out through there, but when I turn this mode on in Vlog, my base ISO becomes 2000. That is because of the comp compositing of images that's happening. Uh, I, I can't go down to 400. I have to be at 2000. So if that's my, I can't go any lower than that in dynamic range boost mode. That's telling me that Panasonic is pretty, pretty confident that that is going to be a clean image. And so I'm going to use that. And that's also a high ISO. So I'm going to use that as my low light mode. I'm going to jump over to Vlog, dynamic range boost when I'm in low light situations, have 2000 and just slowly push my way up that ISO range. Uh, depending on the situation. And then in all other cases, when I'm outside, when I'm just you know, doing something in a very lit situation, I'm gonna turn that mode off and jump back over into the 400 and use that. And so 400, 2000 dynamic range boost, 400 non-dynamic range boost is gonna be my go-to. Yeah, there's a lot There's a lot more here. You actually like gain a stop. Like when I go into Vlog at 2000, this camera's going from 12 stops at dynamic range to 13. So like that's a plus. 
Uh, if, I mean, if you do want to shoot in that mode all the time, then please carry with you uh, ND, uh, variable ND filters because at 2000 ISO, V-Log outside with no way to uh, really stop, I mean, unless you stop the exposure down to 22, which you probably don't want to do, Throw on, the, throw on an ND filter. That, I mean, that is a very doable way of operating in this mode is keeping that mode on all the time in V-Log at 2000 and don't touch ND, don't touch your ISO and just use your variable ND as your third part of your uh, exposure triangle. So again, that's dynamic range boost mode. I have that set to uh, a hotkey uh, on the wheel. So basically when I'm shooting, I just click on the right, it's there, dial down, hit, you know, hit okay everything switches over pretty quickly. Uh, again, if you want to get uh, get my take on what you should customize these buttons to, feel free to reach out on Twitter and uh, ask me and I will let you know because I've been using these cameras for quite a while and the menu systems are starting to get a little more complex. And so having these things at the ready is super crucial when you do a lot of real life things that happen very, very quickly and you need to be ready to shoot with them. Speaking of composite images, there is also a uh, 100 megapixel high res mode. Uh, that's gonna be on your left wheel here. It looks like just two images that are being uh, compiled together, but it's essentially using that IBIS to simultaneously take a bunch of images <laughs> as you press the shutter, takes a picture, but it's also very quickly moving that sensor around and taking a bunch of images and giving you much more much more megapixels, so it gives you a much higher end of the picture. I haven't had a whole lot of chance to mess with the photo stuff on this. I realized I was shooting in all RAW, and Lightroom does not have support for this camera yet, and being that it was V-Log, I got a bunch of flat images, and so I'm just gonna breeze over the photo stuff, uh, really, because I don't shoot a whole lot of photos with this camera. I mainly use it for video, but know that you do have some uh, some cooler functions with this stuff, with the, especially with that 100 megapixel mode. I, I can't wait to try that out once Lightroom starts adding more support for this camera. The rolling shutter has also been improved. I got a little bit of rolling shutter when I was on a very long lens. I think I was about 200 focal distance out, uh, whipping that around. You still get, you know, that's that, it's at its worst, worst scenario, basically, of dealing with that big of a focal distance. But just using the 1235, I could tell that it was reduced quite a bit. And if RAW is your thing, ProRes RAW specifically, you are in luck because you can now pipe out through HDMI to uh, like a Ninja or some kind of monitor that has SSD capture capability and give yourself ProRes RAW recording, which is an, I, I don't use RAW often. I mainly stick with ProRes 422 or HQ. Uh, that's usually good for me, but there are situations where RAW is going to be very handy and that is a very cool feature to be able to do, uh, especially on a mirrorless camera like the GH6. What else am I forgetting here? You have anamorphic mode, you had anamorphic mode in the GH5, uh, the GH6 you have it as well, and you have in-body image stabilization that is specifically for those lenses because not all sensors and lenses can work together equally. Uh, you need to be able to switch over for that. And so you can switch to anamorphic mode, de-squeeze your image, get that vintage anamorphic look, but also have that uh, great smooth handheld that the GH6 offers. The GH6 still has time-lapse and stop-motion animation mode, which I used uh, last year, two years ago, on the GH5, which is really fun because it it adds the onion skin. Basically, uh, you you put it into that mode, hit the shutter, and you get this 50% overlay of the, your previous image, and then you can do your next frame, next frame, and just do all your compositing right in camera instead of having to bounce out the dragon frame. Really fun to use if you are doing little stop motion projects with the kid or whatever. And so that about wraps out my testing of the Panasonic GH6. I will probably mess around with a few more features on this and maybe do little follow-up uh, bits here and there. But so far, this is a pretty... Pretty good upgrade, pretty good um, uh, next generation version of the GH5. Should you upgrade if you have a GH5? I don't know. If you are finding yourself at a at an end with the codex on the GH5, if you want more data, if you're feeling that you're pushing and pulling your image a little bit too much and things are degrading, if you're feeling that in the GH5, then yeah, maybe take a look at this and the ProRes and all that raw stuff. Like There's a whole bunch of more things you can do as the next step forward. But if you're totally happy with your, with your GH5, I don't think this is going to be a huge game changer in terms of, of what you will realize that you use it for. So you kind of have to weigh what it is. Again, there's um, a handful of improvements. Some are going to be more important to others. For me, those codecs, uh, those codecs and the improved image civilization is enough for me to upgrade myself. I really, really want to work with ProRes <laughs> as much as I can, and I'd love to work with RAW on very specific projects. And also this stabilization just... 
uh, it it looks fantastic. I mean, it's already great in the GH5, but now having that much better of uh, IBIS means that I can take off the Lumix lenses and put on prime lenses and have a single point of stabilization. Usually you have dual with the lens, but now I can use single much more confidently and have a smoother image. So that is it. That is my take on the Panasonic GH6, three weeks of testing. Uh, I will shoot more projects with it as they come along and follow you up there. Thank you guys for checking out my journey through cameras, specifically the Panasonic line of cameras. And I will hope to see you again next time with some more camera review technology. See you next time.